Hello and welcome to this session on uh, NMR spectroscopy, where we'll be talking about the specifics of NMR spectra. We'll kind of be encountering um, what creates a peak in an NMR spectra, why they have a particular position in the spectrum. And also we'll be thinking about how we can solve some of the, the problems that um, we have in chemistry and uh, in wider uh, industries um, such as the medical field and how NMR can be utilized for um, different diagnostics, whether that be molecules or whether that be um, molecules within larger biological species like humans or animals. So um, the first thing that we need to kind of understand is that whenever we are looking at NMR uh, spectra, what we are seeing is something called a chemical shift. Um, that gives us the peak position for our um, different uh, nuclei that we are probing. So usually whenever we have a spectrum um, from an NMR, it's usually for one pro or one uh, type of nuclei only. So it could be a hydrogen nuclei, it could be a carbon-13 nuclei, um, those sorts of things. Um, we're just looking at one particular nucleus. Um, well, all of them within that species, but only one at a time. So uh, what we're looking at then is this idea of chemical shift. So the, the magnetic field at the nucleus is not equal to the applied magnetic field. The applied magnetic field, remember, is the one that is generated by our spectrometer. And the reason why it's not um, going to be the same as the nucleus is because the electrons around the nucleus shielded from the applied field. So what happens is that the electrons are orbiting in some way around the nucleus. They are in their orbitals and the presence of these electrons circulating around the nucleus in some way creates uh, another magnetic field. And this magnetic field can either um, oppose or it can um, be in line with the applied magnetic field. And this kind of, um, the effect of these electrons changes how the nucleus um, experiences the applied magnetic field B. And so the difference between the applied magnetic field and the field of the nucleus is termed the nuclear shielding. So an upfield shift means that we have increased shielding and the applied field strength must be increased. And low field shift means we have a deshielded um, nucleus. That means um, we're going to have it at higher, um, higher numbers of the chemical shift. So in all cases, the applied magnetic field must be strong enough to overcome this shielding and whatever is required by the nucleus itself in order to create a signal. So usually that, that's usually not a problem. Usually uh, modern spectrometers are designed that they can produce a magnetic field which is um, fully capable of analyzing our species. So here's a couple of diagrams. Here's the one where the electron is, is spinning around creating a magnetic field. In this case, the magnetic field is opposing the applied magnetic field instead of enhancing it. But it may, it, it's possible for it to enhance. I mean, it's possible that this magnetic field could align with the applied magnetic field. And here we have over here, another um, similar kind of um, diagram where we have a nucleus and we have um, some circulating electrons in their orbitals. And that generates this uh, secondary uh, magnetic field, which in this case is opposing our applied magnetic field again. So all of these electrons, they're spinning around, they're generating um, their own magnetic field and that can um, oppose or um, enhance the applied magnetic field. And it results in a, what's called a chemical shift, the difference between um, the applied magnetic field and that which is um, experienced by the nucleus. Um, so here are a couple of uh, molecules and maybe the magnetic fields that they create. So here we have um, ethylene and here we have um, benzene. So uh, we have a magnetic field which is generated by the electrons in this triple bond. Um, and so that magnetic field um, can oppose the applied magnetic field. And so what it does is it changes the uh, magnetic field experienced by the different nuclei within that molecule. And it causes um, us to observe different chemical shifts. And because of the kind of repeatability of these um, or the sort of the reliability and like it's rather consistent how these different um, chemical moieties, whether they be methyl groups, whether they be double bonds, triple bonds, that kind of thing, they have a very consistent way of interacting with applied magnetic fields. And so that gives us the ability to assign them to a particular type of uh, chemical environment. And so by using a table of data, we can readily assign 
different uh, peaks in our spectrum to different chemical environments, such as the CH group or attached to this triple bond and things like that. And the same thing, of course, in the case of the benzene over here on the right hand side, where we have all of the electrons in the um, aromatic system. That's the, the aromatic ring of the benzene group. They create these um, magnetic fields, which are capable of opposing the um, applied magnetic field, which creates our observed chemical shift. So we've already talked about things like the Larmor frequency frequency when we were learning about the um, functioning of an NMR spectrometer and how those the pulse sequences and things occur. So um, we remember that the Larmor frequency is um, dependent on the strength of the applied magnetic field and also um, on the individual nucleus, which is um, going to be there. And since the applied magnetic field typically is kept constant, um, it's only really going to be dependent on the frequency is only going to be dependent on the um, gyromagnetic ratio, which is specific to that particular nucleus type. And so with the shielding effect, the nucleus experiences a magnetic field of B, which is equal to B0 minus BI. B0 is the applied external magnetic field that comes from our spectrometer, and BI is the induced magnetic field. And so that's coming from the particular chemical environment of the nucleus itself. Um, so the chemical shift is defined as this. So this is this, the frequency that we are observing for our particular sample. And then these are the reference um, frequencies. So that's typically, usually whenever we're doing NMRS spectroscopy, we have a, a solvent which has got um, a little bit of a uh, reference species. Usually that's um, what's called TMS or uh, tetramethylsilane. Um, down here at the bottom, that's tetramethylsilane. It's one silicon atom which has got attached to it four methyl groups. So a methyl group has a carbon with three hydrogens attached to it. So it's one methyl group, two methyl groups, three and four. Um, and so here we can see um, the Larmor frequency for each one of these, uh, the reference here and the, the signal that we're measuring, and then how that can be um, related to the different magnetic fields of the reference and the applied magnetic field. And then the chemical shift here is usually given the letter delta, um, the Greek letter small delta. And so that's equal to the frequency, the Larmor, the Larmor frequency of the sample that we have minus the Larmor frequency of the reference that's also being measured times uh, 10 to the six, just to make it more readable. So this is our TMS. This is a very typical um, reference material. It's not always necessary to use TMS, but it's, it's really probably the most common. Um, so this has a rapid rotation of the methyl groups. And so all of these um, hydrogens are equivalent like um, they all have exactly the same chemical environment. So 12 equivalent protons and four equivalent carbons by symmetry and rapid rotation about the carbon silicon bonds. These can easily rotate much like a kind of like a helicopter type thing. And they're rotating very fast and it effectively creates um, undifferentiated, like you cannot differentiate between the, the different protons or even the different carbons for that matter. So that means it can be used as a reference for both proton NMR and a carbon-13 NMR. So um, here is how uh, spectrum might look um, if we had all of the available different types of proton nuclei. This is for uh, a proton NMR. So here is um, our chemical shift um, and how it's, it's kind of related to this tetramethylsilane. So tetramethylsilane is set at the, as the zero point. And then everything is in reference to that because remember our equation here, chemical shift is related to the shape, the frequency of the reference. So um, the spec, the spectrometer will, with its software, will lock on to the frequency of the TMS, and then it will measure everything relative to that, and will create a, a spectrum with a chemical shift that is readable by humans. So um, remember that the magnetic field, um, which is going to be equal to the applied magnetic field minus the external magnetic field. And so what happens here is in the spectrum, we have different types of nuclei. So TMS is here, that's the zero point. And then everything is measured relative to that. So if something is more shielded than um, the TMS, then it's going to have a negative, um, a negative uh, chemical shift. Uh, but remember negative, positive, it's all just relative to the TMS. It's not really like, you know, positive, it's not really a positive or negative is not really a, like a good or a bad thing. It's just 
how the different nuclei respond and how that is comparable to TMS. Then um, we have here different things. We've got water vapor, we've got HF gas, we've got hydrogen, we've got water at, at zero degrees Celsius, so, so frozen water. Um, ethylene groups, that's a triple bond. Benzene here around about, what's that, about six or seven. And we have uh, chloroform here. We have up here to an H atom. And then over here is a bare proton. So that's got no shielding at all. Um, it's just a proton. Um, so then, uh, so you've got like things here like um, carboxylic acids, you've got um, alcohols and things up here as well. Um, they tend to be less shielded. So they're typically what we call more acidic protons, um, meaning that they're like kind of more reactive. Um, so as we go from small numbers to high numbers, what we're seeing is that we're seeing a reduction in the amount of shielding which a particular atom observes. Um, so we're getting higher and higher chemical shifts. So the chemical shift is defined as nuclear shielding um, or an applied magnetic effect field. So the chemical shift is a function of the nucleus and its environment. So uh, it's not only the nucleus that we're measuring, but also the nuclei which surround that nucleus. And we'll see some of the effects of different types of nuclei as we go through this. And it is measured relative to a reference compound for proton NMR or hydrogen NMR. The reference is usually tetramethylsilane, that molecule that we saw before, the silicon with four methyl groups attached to it. Um, so here are some uh, typical chemical shifts for the different um, protons. So we've got here um, methyl groups, we've got an ethylene group, and we've got a methylene group here. So um, here, this, so this is the CH3 would be attached to the, the chlorine here. And we would get this chemical shift. And if it's a CH2 attached to this chlorine, then we would get this chemical shift for the proton, remember. It's the protons here. Um, and so it just depends on, so for the different methyl groups, like depending on what they're attached to, we get different chemical shifts. So you can see here, if it's attached to a chlorine, it's, it's around about three ppm chemical shift. So reasonably close to our reference material. Um, as we go down here, we're seeing, um, we're getting more and more shielding. So the methyl group here is attached to a benzene ring. So it's, it's really quite well shielded. It's very close to the, the, the reference material um, and so on and so forth. And you can see here more and more shielding as we get um, to these kind of um, uh, alkyl chain type arrangements. So what is causing these chemical shifts? Why are we getting um, a particular shift or a particular peak pattern? Um, it's because of the presence of adjacent uh, nuclei. So if we have one proton and it has one adjacent proton, we get what's called a doublet. So um, here we have in this molecule here, so we've got HA and HA is what we're looking at. So uh, HA is going to affect these two equivalent protons here. So HA is adjacent to, so these protons, HB, are going to be bonded to this carbon here. And on the adjacent nuclei is another proton here. And so this proton, being a J on an adjacent carbon, is able to influence the um, sort of the chemical shift or the splitting pattern of the HB protons. So the HB protons end up splitting into a doublet. So what's happening here is we have an N plus one rule. So the number of adjacent protons plus one equals the number of peaks we're going to get. So we have one proton here. So that's going to end up having um, two peaks because one adjacent proton, this one, um, creates two peaks for these protons here. And now the area under the area under these peaks will be equal to two because there are two protons, but the splitting pattern is defined by the presence of adjacent protons. Now, um, we have a centralized chemical shift for HB. So HB in the presence of no other adjacent protons would have a, uh, a peak around about here. But because of this adjacent proton HA, we end up seeing that it splits into a doublet. So N plus one, so N is equal to one. So one plus one is two, so we've got two peaks. One a peak is going to be um, shifted to a higher chemical shift because of the reinforcement of the field by HA. So if HA is 
um, magnetic uh, moment aligns with the applied magnetic field, then we get um, decreased shielding. And then if it opposes the magnetic field, we get increased shielding and it gets to a lower number. So say this is like about three, this could be 2.5 and this could be 3.5, something like that. Then what happens if we've got two adjacent protons, remember n plus one, so two plus one is three. So we should have three peaks. So in this case, um, we would have uh, two adjacent protons. So in case of HA this time, so HA is the one that is being um, analyzed. It will split into three peaks. Why? Because of the presence of two adjacent protons. So HB, there are two HBs. So two plus one is three. So that means we have three peaks for our HA. So we see then that it's centered around the chemical shift of HA, the natural chemical shift of HA in the absence of um, HB. Um, and then depending on whether or not the, um, the spins of HB uh, align with or oppose the magnetic field, the applied magnetic field that is, uh, we either get um, deshielding or enhanced shielding. The peak in the middle represents the case where the um, magnetic moments of HB oppose each other. So one is reinforcing and the other is opposing um, or vice versa. Um, and that gives us kind of a neutral position which is you know, neither more shielded or less shielded. And so we end up with three peaks because of these two adjacent protons. So this is the N plus one rule. So if a signal is split by N equivalent protons, it is split into N plus one peaks. So the relative peak intensities of symmetric multiplets. So the number of equivalent protons causing splitting. So if we've got um, zero equivalent protons nearby, so there are gonna be no protons on the next carbon, or in this case, um, then we would get a singlet. So just one, one peak. Then um, if we have one adjacent proton that would cause splitting, we get a doublet because we get N plus one. So one plus one is two. And then these are the area ratios of the, the peaks. These are from Pascal's triangle. Um, so uh, what we usually see is in the case of like this one, this peak here has got twice the area of these two here but that the total area of all of these three peaks will be um, equivalent to one proton. So it will give us just the area of one proton, which would mean that these two peaks should have twice the area of these three peaks because these three peaks represent one proton and these two peaks represent two protons. Um, then of course it increases. So the number of equivalent protons, n plus one. So two plus one is a triplet. Three plus one is four, a quartet. Four plus one is five, a quintet. Five plus one is six, a sextet. And six plus one is seven, a septet. And um, these do happen. I mean, if you think about different carbon um, compounds, there can be a lot of protons involved. And um, sometimes they cause very um, large amounts of splitting. So what's happening here? So we've got our applied magnetic field. We've got our different so we got our applied magnetic field pointing in this direction and we have our different um, protons and their different spin orientations. Some of them will oppose the magnetic field and some of them will um, be in line with the magnetic field and in, enhance it or reinforce it, pardon me. And depending on how they align with the applied magnetic field, we'll get different um, peak positions, whether they be de-shielded or um, have increased shielding. So the multiplicity of a multiplet is given by the number of equivalent protons in neighboring atoms plus one, i.e. this is the N plus one rule. So equivalent nuclei do not interact with each other. Um, so these were like the, these, these two nuclei, they're equivalent, they don't interact with each other. This one doesn't have any equivalency, it just is itself on its own because attached to this carbon are two bromines, they don't have a, uh, a chemical shift in our proton NMR, it's only these that we're concerned about. Um, so the equivalent nuclei do not interact with each other. The three methyl protons in ethanol cause splitting of the neighboring methylene protons. They do not cause splitting among themselves. And the coupling constant is not dependent on the applied field. Multiplets can be easily distinguished from closely spaced chemical shift peaks. So um, in the second one here, we have, um, oh, we have our, ethanol, so that's going to have a structure that's like this. 
So we've got two protons on this carbon. We've got three protons on the end terminal carbon. Um, so the carbon, so if a proton is attached to the same carbon, it is going to be what's called equivalent. But if it's attached to an adjacent carbon, it is non-equivalent and will cause the splitting of the peaks. So what this is, is the three methyl protons. So these ones here on the end, these three are the methyl protons, um, cause splitting on the neighboring methylene protons. So these protons. So these three cause splitting of these two. So these two protons will be split by three protons. So N plus one, three plus one is four. We would expect to see a quartet of peaks. And then in the case of these methylene, or sorry, that's the methylene protons. But in the case of these um, methyl protons, there are three of them. So they will have a total peak area equivalent to three protons. Um, so the ratio between the areas of the, the protons here would be three. Here would be two, and this would be one. This will give a peak, but um, it won't be split. It'll be a singlet because it's not got any adjacent protons. So here we have um, the, so yeah. So these ones um, will have an area of three. They'll be split by these two protons here. So these two here will cause a, um, what do you call this? Um, Uh, will be split so the two plus one n plus one so two plus one is three so this will be split these three protons will be split into a triplet and then typically we usually see that the um, protons on an alcohol like this one this h next to the oxygen is uh, present as a singlet in most of our spectra um, if it's an incredibly pure alcohol we may see it split as to a triplet by these adjacent protons here. But usually in most um, samples, it's not pure enough for this to be split into a triplet and we just typically see a single. Um, so here is our ethyl, uh, ethanol spectrum. So we have here um, our different peaks. So we have our methyl group here, we have our methylene group here, and we have our um, alcohol group here. So um, this, this peak here is our TMS. This is our reference. So everything is measured relative to this. It's at approximately zero. Then um, we see here our methyl triplet. So this is a triplet because of two adjacent hydrogens. And these two adjacent hydrogens, N plus one, remember, is our rule, causes the splitting of these methyls into a triplet. So there will be three peaks. And then the methylene quartet. So it's a quartet. Why is it a quartet? Well, because it's split by these three protons here. Um, so three plus one is four. So we end up with a quartet, the methylene quartet. And then this hydrogen on the end um, is, is a singlet. As I said before, um, if it's incredibly pure, like it's really, really pure, uh, there's no water impurities, there's no acid impurities, then we will see it um, be split by these methylene protons. But by and large, in most spectra, it's not pure enough um, for us to observe that kind of splitting. And so we just see a singlet for most alcohols. So the range of magnetic coupling. So uh, equivalent protons do not split each other. We already said that. So um, the protons in a methyl group, like um, these protons here, don't split each other. But these protons split these protons, and these protons split these protons, like that. Uh, protons bonded to the same carbon will split each other only if they are not equivalent. What does that mean? It means they're in different chemical environments. How can they be in different chemical environments? Things like double bonds can create different chemical environments. And we'll see examples of that, uh, non-equivalent protons as we go through. Protons on adjacent carbons normally will couple. And protons separated by four or more bonds will not couple. So, um, so protons on adjacent carbons will normally couple. So these couple each other. Uh, protons separated by four or more bonds will not couple. So these are separated by one, two, three bonds, um, whereas these are like, so these, okay, if I go back here. Um, so this, these protons are coupled to these protons because it's one, two, three bonds away, but these protons and these protons are not coupled because it's one, two, three, four. Okay, um, so splitting for ethyl groups. So here we see um, a benzene ring uh, or a phenyl ring uh, attached to an alkyl chain, which is an ethyl alkyl chain. So we have five equivalent protons here. And we have two equivalent protons here and we have three equivalent protons here. So the ratio of the peak areas will be, for these peaks, it will be five 
to two to three. So we see that here, the integral here is five, the integral here is two, and the integral here is three. So the ratio here is five to two to three. Uh, and the integral, i.e. the area underneath these peaks is representative of the number of protons. So these five protons are split many times by the presence of these uh, protons here. And then um, we have here, uh, these protons here are going to be split by the adjacent protons here on the, the methyl group. And then these uh, protons here are going to be split by the uh, two protons, which are adjacent to them here. Um, so this is a very complicated sort of a spectrum because, and whilst these are equivalent, they're not all going to be split by these because they're, some of them are too far away. So we end up seeing like a bunch of um, like chemically different um, species. So like um, these protons here, um, some of them are split like by this group and some of them are just split by each other. And so we end up with this very complicated um, kind of arrangement of, they're all kind of, chemically similar, but ultimately um, they end up being split quite in a quite complex manner. So usually we just, for the purposes of um, looking at, at um, splitting, we typically just stop with alpha chains. Um, so you can see here and here we have splitting. Um, then isopropyl groups. Um, so here we have an isopropyl group. So that's this one here. Um, and how the different um, chemical shifts are created by different chemical environments. And on top of that, how we have different um, peak areas or ratios between the peaks. So if we look at um, our molecule here, we have three different types of protons. We've got the protons, isolated protons here. Um, there's three of them on this methyl group. They're isolated and they're not coupled because they're too far away from this proton. So um, it's gonna be from the hydrogen to the carbon is one bond, from the carbon to the carbon is a second bond, from the carbon to the carbon is a third bond, from the carbon to this hydrogen is four bonds. Remember, typically that's too far for coupling to occur. So these protons are gonna be a singlet. And that's exactly what we see, a singlet. So even though there are three of them, they're not coupled by anything else. And so they end up just having a singlet. Then we have um, these carbons here, which are this hydrogen, which we'll call hydrogen C. And so that hydrogen is going to be split by both of these adjacent sets. So what we have is, um, how many? So we've got three adjacent carbons, or three adjacent hydrogens here and three adjacent hydrogens here. So that's three plus three is going to be six. N plus one is a six plus one is seven. So we end up with uh, a septet here. But the area of this is only going to be equal to one because there's only one proton. But there are, should be seven peaks here. One, two, three, four, five, six, seven, yeah. Okay, so there are seven peaks here. This single proton has been split into a septet. And then these, um, carbons, or see, these hydrogens on these two methyl groups are equivalent to each other. Um, they are adjacent to one proton. So that means we're going to end up with n plus one. So one plus one is two. We're going to end up with a doublet. So we have a doublet over here, which is our B protons, but um, the area under here is going to, well, the ratio of areas is going to be six here. So the ratio of areas is always going to reflect the number of protons of that type with that, that chemical shift. So for Hydrogen C, we have only got one proton. So the area here is the ratio is going to be one to three to six because we've got one proton of type C, we've got three of type A, and we've got six of type B. So the area ratio is one to three to six. That ratio always reflects the number of protons which are in the molecule and the number of protons of that type. So this is how we can kind of like um, solve a problem where we have an unknown compound and we can st solve its structure usually pretty well um, if we know how many hydrogens are present, how many carbons are present and things like that, which you can get from mass spectroscopy. There are a lot of um, different techniques available to the instrumental analytical chemist in, uh, or even organic or physical chemist in um, determining our unknowns. Uh, 
So coupling constants. So this is the distance between the peaks of a multiplet. So you see, see here that there is a there is a there's a separation between these peaks and these peaks here. Measured in hertz, which we all we already talked a little bit about this in a previous session, uh, but we're going to talk about it more here. Uh, but it's coupling constants. Multiplets with the same coupling constants may come from adjacent groups of protons that split each other. So here are some values for coupling constants. So if we have free rotation, so these two hydrogens here, we have quite a small um, coupling constant. So the coupling constant here is seven hertz. Um, here we have um, some of our double bonds, which create our um, non-equivalent uh, hydrogens that can still be attached to the same um, carbon. Can be on the same carbon, but can have different um, chemical environments. So we see here for the cis isomer, we have 10 hertz. For the trans isomer, we have 15 hertz. And for the geminal isomer, we have 2 hertz. So the value of seven hertz in an alkyl group is average for rapid rotation about the about the carbon-carbon bond. And if rotation is hindered by a ring or bulky groups, other splitting constants may be observed. So there can be complex splitting. We talked about, uh, I briefly mentioned this, like the idea of non-equivalent hydrogens. So signals may be split by adjacent protons. So they can be different from each other with different coupling constants. So for example, here, HA, so this hydrogen here of styrene, which is split by an adjacent hydrogen trans to it, so this one, HB, and then an adjacent hydrogen cis to it, HC. So that means it's gonna be split individually by this one and then by this one, and they have different coupling constants, which will create a more complex spectrum. So this is how the splitting will go. So the splitting of HA is here. So first of all, it will be split by the presence of HB, which will have a splitting constant J of 17 Hertz. And so that will create two, it will create a doublet first of all. So a doublet centered here and a doublet centered here. So this is where our two peaks will be. So after the first splitting because of HB, um, we will get a doublet. And then that doublet will be split again by HC. And that will have a separation between the peaks of 11 Hertz. And so this is what is termed a doublet of doublets because this is a first doublet. And then this is the doublet of doublets. So this is a doublet and then it's split again by a doublet. So it's a doublet of doublets. So the first splitting is a doublet because there's only one proton of that type. So one plus one is two. And then the second one is a doublet again because it is split by um, this proton here, HC. Usually what happens is the larger splitting, um, the larger chemical um, coupling constant splits first. So the 17 Hertz goes first and then the uh, 11 Hertz goes second because it has got a smaller coupling. Uh, or sorry, yeah, smaller coupling constant. Um, it's just generally the way that it's observed experimentally. And then we can look at the same thing for HB. So first of all, it's split by HA. So HB split HA by 17 Hertz. So the same is true in reverse, it splits by 17. And then HB and HC do not have as big of a splitting. So the doublet of doublets is closer together in these two instances. And of course, they're centered around the chemical shifts here of HA and HB. Uh, here is the spectrum of styrene. Um, so that's just what we were talking about. And we can see how experimentally it is observed as being um, HC here is split as a doublet of doublets, HB as a doublet of doublets as well, and HA as a doublet of doublets. But you can see that the structures of them are a little bit different. So these ones, the doublets are very close together on the second splitting, and the same as here, whereas here they're quite far apart. Um, sometimes they are different like relative heights, but the area underneath the curve should be the same. The reason why they have different heights is because of uh, changes in the baseline and, and things that are generally out of our control. And then over here, this big mass of things is the, um, the benzene ring. So stereochemical non-equivalence. So that, that styrene uh, NMR spectrum was an example of this. And so usually these are two protons on the same carbon, um, which are non-equivalent. Um, you, usually they are equivalent, like in the case of a methyl group or an ethyl group or a methylene group. But in the case that we saw with the styrene, sometimes they're not. Um, if the replacement of each of the protons of a CH2 group with an imaginary Z gives stereoisomers, then the protons are non-equivalent and will split with each other. So it's just a, 
a mental exercise we can do to try, try and determine if um, a particular nuclei is stereochemically equivalent. So here are some uh, non-equivalent protons, some examples. So we've got our styrene example, which we just did in detail. Then we have um, this um, uh, propane uh, molecule, uh, which has got a two chlorines here and here. Um, you can see that these protons are stereochemically non-equivalent because this one is adjacent to a hydrogen, this one is adjacent to a chlorine. Um, and then this uh, cyclopentane ring as well has non-equivalent uh, protons. So, External. So depending on um, the frequency that we are using, um, we get, get different sort of, we end up with different uh, signals that come out of our spectrometer, which we then Fourier transform to get our spectrum. So the molecules are tumbling relative to the magnetic field. So the NMR is an average spectrum of all the orientations. So the different magnetic fields can be aligned, they can be opposing, they can be pointing in an opposite direction um, and different, uh, depending on how they're held within the molecule and how the molecule um, kind of aligns, like the molecule will have an overall magnetic moment, but the individual uh, atom nuclei uh, may have different magnetic moments, which may be uh, pointing in different directions to the overall molecule. So axial and equatorial protons on cyclohexane interconvert so rapidly that they give a single signal. Um, uh, proton transfers for OEH and NH may occur so quickly that the proton is not split by adjacent protons in the molecule. So hydroxyl protons, so ultra pure samples of ethanol show splitting. So this is what I talked about earlier, the idea of OEH um, protons sometimes being split, but only if it's really, really pure. If it's not so pure, like a little bit of water, a little bit of uh, acidic impurities, we will see no splitting. So the top spectrum here is an ultra pure sample of ethanol, like almost 100% pure, if not 100% pure. And we can see that this OH peak here is split into a triplet by the presence of this methylene group here. So these two protons here, remember our N plus one rule, so two protons adjacent gives us three peaks, which turns out to be a triplet. This is an ultra pure sample. But if we see a little bit of impurities, what happens is that this OH group here becomes a singlet. And this is because of um, this proton being quite reactive. It can easily be exchanged with other protons in other molecules with the impurity things like that. So what happens is like the proton exchanges very rapidly between different molecules and it creates an averaged single peak, which is no longer split by the methylene group. So that's just something to be aware of and to try and remember when we're dealing with OH protons. Um, NH protons um, can do something similar. In fact, NH protons, the exchange happens so quickly that we get a broadening of the peak. So it's no longer a sharp peak at all. You can see here, these are the NH2 uh, protons. So they exchange so rapidly that it's no longer a sharp peak like these, it's just really rather broad. And that is an indication of just how reactive sometimes these can be or how rapid the exchange can happen. Okay, so how do we identify if it's an OH peak or an NH peak? Um, so the chemical shift will depend on the concentration of our particular species and the solvent that we're using. So to identify that a particular peak is due to OH or NH, we're gonna shake the sample with D2O. D2, why do we do this? Well, this can cause an exchange and it can cause us to get um, a deuterated um, sample. So deuterium exchange will happen with the OH or NH protons. So we will get OD or ND. And then on the second uh, NMR spectrum, the peak will be absent or much less intense due to, well, because the deuterium uh, is, um, not really a proton NMR active because of its a spin is now one as opposed to a half. So here we have a spectrum and uh, what we have here is the NMR spectrum and peak integral curve for an organic compound with this empirical formula C5H10O2, well, uh, which is in the solvent CCL4, which has got a TMS um, reference uh, molecule inside of it. And so what we are going to be doing is we're going to try and identify this organic compound. We have the empirical formula, so we know how many carbons there are, we know how many hydrogens there are, we also know how many oxygens there are. 
Um, the presence of two oxygens probably tells us that we're dealing with a carboxylic acid, um, but we may not be. We may be dealing with an ether or um, an ester. Um, so first things first is that we're given this spectrum here. Um, we see that there's no real peak at a high uh, chemical shift. Most of them are kind of low chemical shifts, which indicates that we probably don't have any hydrogens attached to an oxygen. Um, it seems like we probably just have alkyl um, hydrogens. So like it could be in a methyl group, a methylene group, um, things like that. So uh, we look at the ratios of the peak area. So this is a six to four to four to six. So six, I, the, the decimal, the point after the decimal point, um, sometimes the areas are not perfect. This is due to experimental error or um, just the way that the acquisition was done. Um, but usually we just look at the larger number. So it's, this is six, this is four, this is four, and this is six. So add these together, six plus four is 10, plus four is 14, plus six is going to be um, 20. So that's, 20 for the areas of the, um, the peaks of uh, our molecule for the hydrogens. This is a hydrogen NMR. Um, so the ratio we have here is going to be, um, so since we only have 10, we have to divide that 20 by two. So we would have three, uh, we would have two, we would have two, and we would have three. So we have, four distinct types of hydrogens because we've got four distinct peak areas. We've got one here, uh, we've got another one here, we've got another one here, and another one here. So that's one, two, three, four. So we've got four different types of profiles. There are two which are in groups of three, and there are two which are in groups of two. Um, already, maybe you can start to see a picture emerging. What kind of chemical moiety, what kind of chemical structure do we see three protons on? Um, so let's look at this one first. So this one here is a singlet. There's no splitting here. Um, and it's got an area of three. So this is probably a methylene group. So it's probably some sort of CH3, which is isolated from any other protons. Um, okay, because it's not split. That's why it's like, if it, if it had any kind of splitting, that would mean we have adjacent protons. Um, so we have an isolated CH3 because it's single peak, okay. Um, then over here, we have another CH3, most likely. Um, but this time it is split. So it's split into a triplet. So remember our N plus one rule, if we've got three peaks, that means um, our N must be equal to two because two plus one is equal to three. So this must be adjacent to some sort, this must be adjacent to two um, hydrogens. So it could be adjacent to one of these two sets here, which we've already established have two protons in them. So that would indicate to us that we have, um, an adjacent CH2 group, okay. Then, uh, so that's an alkyl chain with a terminal CH3, that's gonna be our triplet. Then we focus our attention now on these two um, groups here. So we have one which has got um, more, we have one that's got more peaks and one which has got less peaks, um, which means that this one's probably going to be adjacent to a lot of protons. So it's likely that then we have um, this one being in the middle of two groups of CH2, um, so it's likely like this. Um, so we probably have an alkyl chain of this type here, uh, like so. And then, um, so that gives us what? One, two, three, four carbons. So we've got five carbons in total. So there needs to be another carbon somewhere in here. And then there has to be two oxygens of some sort. So, um, which don't have hydrogens attached to them. So it's probably gonna be some sort of like double bond oxygen, probably gonna be an ester that looks at things. And then this oxygen here is attached to this carbon there. And so this is alkyl G and CH2 groups. These are gonna be multiplets. And so we have a structure like this. So there's a methyl group here, methyl group here. And then these are our two methylene groups, the CH2s here and here. Okay. Okay, so that was proton NMR um, and how we might uh, determine the structure of an unknown compound. Um, then another very common type of NMR is carbon-13. Why is it common? Well, much like proton NMR is very common because finding a hydrogen atom in the universe is very easy because there are a lot of them. Um, carbon-13, the isotope, um, normally carbon is carbon-12, but the isotope carbon-13 has an abundance of around about 1%, which is sufficient for us to have a significant number of them in our um, molecules. 
which means that without really doing anything else, we can still measure the carbon-13 NMR. However, because um, it's relatively low in abundance, around 1%, and because the gyromagnetic ratio is um, somewhat different from the proton, we end up having um, a harder time finding these kinds of isotopes or these kind of uh, nuclei. Um, it's, a hard, it's a harder experiment to do. Um, usually it's noisier, but um, because it is valuable and it is useful, there's been a lot of advances in this area which have kind of made it um, easier to do and has kind of overcome the challenges. So, uh, yeah, so we talked about that, talked about that. It's, its sensitivity is around about 400 um, times. And then the serious, so the problem, one of the problems is it's seriously coupled with proton NMR. Um, so we end up um, having a problem seeing um, our carbons. Um, usually you get a lot of peaks, it's very complex. Um, so we have to somehow decouple it from the proton NMR spectrum, which is something that can be done. Um, so we don't normally see a carbon-13, carbon-13 spin-spin coupling. It's not really observed. So that's carbon carbons adjacent to each other. Um, and then we have no coupling between uh, carbon-13 and carbon-12 um, because um, of the L values uh, being equal to zero. Um, then we have broadband decoupling and off-resonance decoupling as well. So what is broadband decoupling? So this is one of the ways in which we try to remove the effect of the protons. So spin-spin splitting of carbon-13 lines by proton uh, and nuclei is avoided by reading the sample with a broadband radio frequency signal. So the signal that encompasses the entire proton spectral region, so it tries to avoid that um, problem of this coupling of the protons by just blasting the sample with the entire range of the proton NMR. So this is what the spectrum looks like if it's decoupled, and this is what it looks like if it's not decoupled. Very complex with overlapping peaks from different carbons. So these are the peaks from the different carbons. If it's decoupled, if it's not decoupled, then you get a very complex spectra. Um, which is hard to interpret. Um, off resonance decoupling. So the decoupling frequency is set at 1,000 to 2,000 hertz above the proton spectral range, which leads to a partially decoupled spectrum in which all but the largest spin spin shifts are absent. So this is another technique to kind of overcome that uh, complex nature of the spectra caused by the presence of the protons. So really, like these are like what I want you to take away from this is that the the, the two ways in which we remove that proton um, carbon-13 coupling is through broadband decoupling and off-resonance decoupling. Um, here are some of the, the chemical shifts for carbon-13. Uh, you remember the chemical shift is obtained in a rather similar manner to the chemical shifts that we see in our, um, what do you call this? In our um, proton NMR, so like they're based on the difference between um, the shift, the frequency that the Larmor frequency that we observe for our peak and um, the Larmor frequency for our reference sample. Because if, depending on the chemical environment, so carbon carbon bonds um, generally quite uh, well shielded. Um, and then if you go up here to carbon double bond oxygen bonds, so like aldehydes, acids, ketones, ethers, and so on, they're all very de shielded um, and way up here carbon-carbon double bonds as well, carbon-carbon triple bonds um, tend to be in the middle of the region here, around about 80 to 120. And then um, very, very de-shielded up here in the ketone acid range, which is carbon-oxygen double bonds. Um, solid state NMR, this is useful for samples such as glasses, like silica glasses and things like that, and um, can be very important. So, um, unfortunately, because of the way that the nuclei are kind of fixed in position, it's kind of hard for them to uh, relax, which means that we get very broad spectra. So there's a broad um, peak shape um, of even carbon-13 is caused by static dipolar interactions between um, carbon-13 and the protons, and we have anisotropy in uh, carbon-13 shielding tensors. To reduce the line broadening effect, um, we sometimes use something called a magic angle. So this is really the takeaway point here. Um, uh, by actually spinning the sample, the, the solid, like the solid sample at a, a certain angle, which is 54.7 degrees uh, called the magic angle, um, it actually helps to reduce this anisotropy. So if we like kind of spin it at an angle in the magnetic field, um, it ends up uh, reducing the anisotropy that we observe in our spectrum. So, yeah, by using this 54.7 degrees magic angle, we're 
we're kind of reducing the the kind of um, artifacts which can happen or the mistakes that can be made in our spectral gathering because of um, the orientation of the sample in the magnetic field and the way that the um, radio frequency pulse is passed through the sample. So um, it basically creates a more average sample that's more representative of the whole sample. Um, because otherwise, like you could have, like because it's solid, like the nuclei can't really reorientate themselves. So um, if we place it in the spectrometer, depending on how we place it in the spectrometer, we could get different results. So by spinning it at this 54.7 degrees angle, we reduce that by um, a significant margin. And so we can create more reliable results. Um, so here uh, is an example of a spectrum of solid state um, carbon NMR. So this is for this uh, sample here, adamantine. Uh, so carbon-13 spectra of crystalline adamantine. So A, this is the non-spinning um, and has no proton decoupling. So you just see broad spectra with nothing really going on. Then here we've got non-spinning, but with dipolar decoupling and cross-polarization. So we see that there are two peaks now present. Um, and then we can make these peaks more narrow with magic angle spinning, uh, but without dipolar decoupling or cross-polarization. So both B and C are um, just either magic angle or decoupling. Um, and they can go from this broad, 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 broad peak to what is clearly two peaks. Uh, by combining both uh, the magic angle spinning, decoupling and cross polarization, we can get very, very sharp peaks. And that can really um, tell us a lot and give us a lot of reliable information about a solid state structure. Uh, Multi-dimensional NMR. So this is another way of interpreting spectra which are um, a little bit more complex. So uh, you've got different types, you've got cozy, you've got nosy, you've got tozy, just depends on the type of spin echo that we're doing or the particular um, experimental technique. And it gives us two different types of chemical shifts, which can tell us a lot about a, the individual structure, the individual environment of the particular atoms and nuclei. So multidimensional NMR. So the illustration of the use of the two dimensional spectrum A, A which is this one, to, a, um, to identify the carbon-13 resonances in the one-dimensional spectrum B here. So this is kind of hard to tell. We're not really sure where these carbons are coming from, but in the two-dimensional one, what we can do is we can split it up into different um, uh, chemical shifts and different chemical environments. So I uh, note that the ordinary one-dimensional spectrum is obtained from the peaks along the diagonal. So going like here, like here, um, the presence of off-diagonal cross peaks can identify resonances linked by spin-spin coupling. So the diagonal is going along here. So any peaks that are present, so if we draw a line here and here, we see peaks present, we can tell that they are coupled to each other. That means that they are adjacent to each other, which means that we can determine the structure much more easily. Okay, so uh, here is a typical uh, 90 degree FID sequence. So this is our typical pulse sequence, which gets our um, usual um, NMR spectrum. So we have our um, magnetic dipoles aligned with the um, applied magnetic field. Um, we then uh, put uh, RF frequency pulse at 90 degrees, which causes the uh, molecules dipoles all to align 90 degrees to the applied magnetic field like so. They start to process then because they're at perpendicular to the applied magnetic field, which is still in the same direction, the Z direction. They begin to process and uh, over time they relax back up to being in line with the um, applied magnetic field and depending on how uh, they are shielded or deshielded or how quickly it can um, spin the different nuclei we get different um, signals out in the FID signal and then that can be transformed Fourier transformed from um, the time to the frequency domain and we get our peaks like so. Now, in the case of a two-dimensional uh, NMR uh, spectrum um, or experiment, uh, what we have to do now is we have to allow the, um, the spins to mix. So what happens is we, we, we use two pulses. We use a 90-degree pulse, which um, kind of turns the, um, the magnetic moments of our nuclei um, from being in line with the applied magnetic field to being um, perpendicular to it. And then after a certain period of time, what we do is we excite it again with another 
a 180 degree pulse. And the reason why we do that is because over time, the spins start to relax, but they relax in different ways at different speeds and they kind of diverge. So they create a, an average spectrum, which is kind of hard to interpret, which is kind of like pointing in all directions. And we don't really want that. So what happens is we, um, by uh, exciting it again with 180 degree pulse, we can uh, arrest that kind of um, relaxation in multiple different directions and we can have them converge again into a single point. Uh, and then using that, we get an, uh, an intense signal called the echo, which is where we pick up our signal for our multi-dimensional NMR spectrum measurements. So um, here is what's going on. So we have like much like our FID 90 that we just did for our normal NMR experiment. Uh, we have a 90 degree uh, pulse, radio frequency pulse, which um, creates um, the, um, or switches the NMR, or switches the, molecules magnetic field direction to be perpendicular to the applied magnetic field. So it goes from in line to perpendicular after the 90 degree pulse. And then we can measure that as an FID. Now, what happens is that these start to split. Um, so they start to relax, they start to process around, they start to split. So they're no longer, they start off all aligned with each other, but over time they start to diverge because some of them are different chemical environments and they, they experience different uh, speeds of relaxation. Now, what you can do is you can uh, excite that with another um, pulse, but this time it's 180 degree pulse, which causes the, um, so here's the splitting. So this red and the blue were originally aligned with each other, but over time due to different speeds of relaxation, they split. And then if we arrest it by uh, exciting it with a 180 degree RF pulse, then what happens is they start to converge again into a single point. And then whenever they are all aligned with each other again, that is when we get the strongest signal coming out of the um, molecule. And that is called the echo. And that is what we measure. So this is how the spin echo sequence happens. So we do the normal experiment first. And then after, the, after a certain period of time, the signals start to um, weaken because all of the magnetic dipole moments are pointing in different directions. So at that point, what we do is we pulse through 180 degree uh, pulse of RF frequency. And then this causes them all to converge again, all of the magnetic uh, moments to converge again. And then when they converge, they give a very strong signal, which is going to be our echo signal. Um, and so that's kind of the acquisition process of these two dimensional spectra. We won't really spend a lot of time going into two dimensional spectra, but I just wanted you to know how it worked in brief terms. Then um, NMR, NMR spect spectroscopy can be applied to um, biological tissue. Um, you may have heard of MRI scanners. You may not have known that they use the same um, techniques as we use for NMR in our spectra. It's called MRI because, well, people don't really like it whenever you say nuclear and I'm going to put you inside of it. They kind of think of nuclear energy, radiation, things like that. I mean, it is a form of radiation, but it's radio frequency radiation, which we're surrounded by all the time, um, just from like the car radios or whatever. Um, a Wi-Fi is a type of uh, radiation as well. Like, you know, it, there are, there's dangerous radiation and there's not so dangerous radiation. And this is one of those not so dangerous radiations. Um, so what we can do is we can um, get uh, cross sections of human tissue or biological tissue. It can be applied to humans, animals, whatever, as long as you can get them to stay still for long enough. So it can give us very detailed pictures of um, tissue. Um, it can really help with diagnosis of different conditions. Um, can tell us about uh, a macular degeneration, brain degeneration, uh, brain tissue, gray matter degeneration. That's one of the ways in which um, things like CTE was discovered was through the NMR of athletes' brains um, years after they had played in very physical sports like American football or something like that, um, where they had a lot of head injuries. Um, so what we get is like, we get a slice every one centimeter through the body or through whatever particular part of that body is. And we can then see how the, the matter changes and how the different biological tissue changes. And you can spot any kind of problems and diagnose any conditions pretty easily. So NM, eh, sorry, MRI is magnetic resonance imaging. It's non-invasive. So there's, there's no like surgery involved. 
um, the nuclear word, because we're still interacting with the nuclei of uh, different molecules in your body. Um, but we admit that because um, people wouldn't go inside an MRI machine if it was called an NMRI machine. Um, because the fear that it's radioactive, but it's really, it's really not, it's not dangerous. So only protons in one plane can be in resonance at one time. So one plane, so like literally you take a cross section through the human body. So like um, through your hand, every one centimeter kind of thing, or through your leg or whatever it happens to be. Um, so the computer puts together slices to get the three dimensional image. And then things like tumors can be readily detected. Things like brain conditions can be readily detected. A minute fractures, things like that can all be seen very easily using the NMRs or the MRI spectroscopy. Um, so this is kind of how it works. So you apply a differential uh, magnetic field through the body. And then that means that the different nuclei experience different strengths of that field. Um, and then as you change the frequency that you, um, if you, as you change the frequency of the radio frequency pulse, so changing it by several hundred Hertz every time you get uh, you move one centimeter at a time through the body and you get different um, cross sections. So basically like because the magnetic field at the back of the head in this, this particular example and the front of the head are different. Um, so the field is weaker at the back of the head, stronger at the front of the head. That means those we're selectively um, changing the magnetic field, which is experienced by the um, different nuclei. And remember from the Larmor frequency that so long as the nuclei are all hydrogen nuclei, so they're all have the same gyromagnetic ratio, which means that the only thing is changing is the magnetic field, which means that if we change the frequency, the radio frequency, we'll end up kind of imaging or detecting different protons as we move through the body. Um, so the frequency that the absorption will happen or um, here will be different from here, will be different from here. And so that's how we get the slice spectrum. And so since like that has a very well-defined relationship with the electric or the magnetic field and that we apply, um, we can very consistently get slices of like say one centimeter or one millimeter or half a centimeter. Usually it's one centimeter because otherwise it takes too long and people can't really stay still for that long. So you really have like an hour max um, to measure um, someone's entire cross section of their body. So you don't have a lot of time. So um, that's kind of how that works. And that's how MRI works. And that's kind of like where we're gonna leave off here on our uh, discussion of NMR. So thank you for watching and listening.